Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Baines are back from vacation. They they went to Hepzibah and back. Don't don't use that one during Sunday school. So. I'm glad they left Hepzibah because I don't know I can hardly pronounce it and I don't know how to spell it. But it was a good place to live for a while. Been looking at some of my mother's old uh, photo album photos. See a lot of uh, good times that were spent there when they lived down that little dirt road off the side. But I'm glad that uh, they're back home and have been almost for many years, some more years than I can remember there. It's good to see you this morning. We're glad that you're here. This is our third lesson on the book of Isaiah. Let me grab my book. It's right over here. This is uh, the new quarter, and we're, as I said, the third lesson into the book of Isaiah. Today we're going to be looking at the promises of God. And uh, still, let us know if you would like to have a Sunday school quarterly. We'll do our best to get one to you. We'll drop ship it to you or drop it on the front porch or meet you somewhere. Just let us know if you need that. We'll be looking at the seventh chapter of the book of Isaiah today. And uh, if you care to, I've mentioned this on both sessions. There's a really nice uh, image or drawing, a graph or a chart, if you would, that I've been using for refresher. It might be a tool that maybe you've never seen anything like it before. I've put a copy of it in our newsletter. You can get the newsletter if you have a smartphone or a tablet or a pad or a computer, a laptop or a desktop computer. But on the second or third, third or fourth page, I guess, I have this up on the uh, wall here on the large screen this morning. I know that you can't see it if you're streaming in this morning. But as I've shared, it can give you a, an idea of how things, what, what, is the, how, what is the shape of the Old Testament? Who is Amos or Hosea, Haggai, Habakkuk, all of those, is that just a bunch of random people that somehow or another got gathered into the Bible? Well, no. Uh, we, we, primarily, once you get past uh, the founding of the Hebrew nation in the early chapters of Genesis, the story then becomes about just about the political and religious life of the nation of Israel. And so it helps me understand it when I can look at a drawing and I can see the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah going parallel to each other. They Both kingdoms had different kings at different times. And at each time uh, that king received visitations from the prophets of God. God would send prophets to them to advise them or to warn them or to give them counsel. And so, just looking at the 39 books of the Old Testament, it's not laid out like that at all. And it's a, there's, a, there's a logic to it, but not, it's not chronological. So, we look at the book of, books of First and Second Samuel. It's about the choice of the very first king. And about the kings that followed there. Saul, David, Solomon, Jeroboam, Rehoboam were the kings of the divided kingdom. And then as those kings, they, many of them, some of them followed God. Some of them were good kings and they led in the way of, of the one God, our God. But many served and ran after idols. And they also led to any time a king embraced idolatry or false gods, or the religions of the land of Canaan, they always led and promoted the nation of Israel to do the same. So it was disastrous. Today we come to Isaiah chapter 7, and I confess to you that even though I've studied it for a very long time, a lot of the political or historical facts seem to run together to me. It seems now more than, than before. Maybe it's because... I have more facts and more information in my brain, and sometimes that just makes things more crowded. It doesn't make things more clear. There are many things in our world today that uh, about politics, about 
the running of governments, about politicians and personalities, famous people and celebrities. There are very few, in my mind today, great notable men or women of God. There are, of course, great heroes of our faith. And there are people who uh, are, do have great and influential ministries. But uh, early in my ministry and in my faith, there were uh, gigantic people. Of course, it's only been a few years back since the evangelist Billy Graham passed away. And it was, there was no one better known than he. No one who sat more with presidents and governors and kings. All the different people in the world, people knew Billy Graham. And I wondered, how can we survive with Billy gone? Well, as it turns out, he's still on TV just about every night. <laughs> They're still airing crusades, and he's still preaching. And uh, I was uh, transposing one of my old messages recently, just this last week, and I found myself making reference to Billy Graham. Billy Graham was always giving the invitation. That's what his messages were all about. He, he, from the very first word of the sermon, he was telling you to come to Jesus and how to do it. And so uh, his, when it came time to actually sing Just As I Am, the people who were ready were ready. So there's a great deal of intrigue. There's a great deal of there's militarism, kings of this and countries. We're still talking about Jerusalem and Judea, and, you know, we, we continue to talk about the unification of Israel today. Well, they were divided way back then in the time of Isaiah. Brother against brother. You know, we talk about the Palestinians, or the Arabs, and the Jews. We act like we're talking about people from different worlds, different planets, perhaps. But they're all sons and daughters of Abraham, aren't they? Every one of them are sons and daughters of Abraham. They're all related. They're half-brothers and half-sisters. They're members of the same family. And so when we're talking to them, uh, it, it should not be their blood or their kinship or their history that divides them, and yet, yet that it, it does. If you can't sort out all of it, it starts out in chapter 7, verse 1. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the king of Uzziah, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. So you see, you've got lots of names of people that we don't know, names that we don't know about. But it's still, it's going to be a mention of Syria here. Now, Syria is an ancient nation. There is still a nation in the Middle East that is the nation of Syria. We hear about it in the news every day. Now, not as often we'll hear about Assyria. Now, Assyria, the capital, was Babylon. The Assyrians are like uh, the Iraqis, the modern Iraq and uh, Iran, that area there. So we're really talking, you know, recently our president was able to uh, meet with certain people of Arab nations, the United Arab, Arab Emirates. Pledge allegiance to that. That's, that's kind of the United Arab, Arab Emirates. Sounds like a, a club or something or a company instead of a country. But they, uh, this last week, with a number of Arab nations, that uh, we have been able, our, our government was able to broker our lead in the signing of very important trade agreements, political agreements that will lead to peaceful interaction. This has been done before. I don't, I don't want to, uh, to downplay this. Anytime you can get the kids to stop fighting and killing each other, even for just a day, you ought to give that person a little bit of credit. But here we are studying an ancient Bible passage. What's it about, Pastor? Oh, the people over in the Middle East are fighting with each other. He says, no, I mean, really, what's it about? I said, yeah, that's it. That's it. They've been fighting for a long time. And here, what happened is, is what makes it worse always is that 
the Jewish people that formed the nation of Israel, those ten tribes, and the two tribes that formed the nation of Judah, they've begun to ally themselves with the people around them, with the nations around them. They've been signing treaties and making deals so that they might attack each other in power and strength. And that's what he's talking about here. Now, what we're going to see in chapter 7 is that God sends Isaiah to King Ahaz. He tells King Ahaz. Now, what has happened in verse 1 here is that the Syrians and their leadership have allied themselves with Israel. And they're going to attack Jerusalem. Now, don't get lost, I said, in the clutter. Fighting, violence, harming other people. It's never, it's never the way. It's never the way. Anytime you find yourself angry at someone, Jesus said... If you're angry with someone without a cause, you know the, the, the bad part of that when Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount is we all, when we're angry at someone, we always think that we have a good reason for being upset and angry. But the thing about it is, is that we're not the one who on Judgment Day, who's going, I'm not going to decide my causes if my causes were true. God is going to tell me, you didn't have a good reason for that. You didn't have a good cause for that. You were just angry with someone for selfish reasons or because of your own petty preferences. That happens. So anytime we are stirred to anger, yes, there is righteous indignation and there are things that should stir our passions, but that's not anger and that's not, that's not to, to have a rebellious spirit or a destructive action. You want to find out how to change the world, regardless of what people in the world today may think about Christians or believers. When they nailed our Savior to the cross, and when they stoned us, and when they imprisoned us and persecuted us and cast us to the beasts, we didn't come back with uh, terrorist tactics to gain our revenge. We didn't plead for the blood of our family members. So many times the Bible says we are, are like sheep are led to the slaughter. We gave our blood. We died. There was no uprising. Even G, one of Jesus' disciples was a zealot. He had political leanings that always led to violence. On the night that Jesus was arrested, Jesus said, how many swords do we have? One of the disciples said, we got one. Remember what Jesus said? That'll be enough. <laughs> That'll get it. Yeah, all we've got to do is cut off one ear tonight. That's all we need. That'll be enough. That'll be enough. I was watching, I was re-watching The Matrix. I know you all watch that often. Keno, Keno Reeves. I like that scene when he's going to go back into the matrix and face the agents. And uh, the guy that prepares them to go back into the matrix, he says, well, what are you going to need? He said, lots of guns. <laughs> lots of guns. And all of a sudden they appear in a room where you've just guns on the shelves as far as you can see. And they begin sticking them in every pocket of their outfit, every belt. Lots of guns. We're, you know, Jesus, how many, how many guns we got? One, she said, all right, that'd be enough. Got any bullets? They said, no, I don't have any bullets. <laughs> okay, no problem. Whatever anybody thinks about Christians or Christian history or however they interpret our history, we change the world. We change the world. We turned the Roman emperor, Constantine, into a Christian. <laughs> That's how we win. That's how we defeat. You know who in the early days of Christianity, one of the greatest persecutors of Christianity was? Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. And Jesus said, okay, I'll fix that. 
turn Saul into a believer. One of the he says, you know, I, I think I'm going to really show off. Let's turn him. Let's turn Saul of Tarsus into one of the greatest Christians who's ever lived. Okay. And Saul was stoned, and he was chased out of town. He was ultimately beheaded by Nero. We changed the world. The world, there, there is no greater religion, no more. There's nobody who follows any religion. More, more people follow Jesus than any other religion. There are no Roman signets flying over the city of Rome this morning. What is it? It's the cross. It's the cross. And we didn't hurt anybody. We didn't attack anybody. We didn't form a resistance. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, don't resist. Give in. Give up. Recently, I received a note from our a director of missions, Brother Ken, showed about how they're really, really buckling down against the churches and the Christians in China. More and more persecution. I wrote back to Brother Ken, bad idea. <laughs> it's a bad idea. Because the hotter the flame gets, the more the blood spreads and the cross is lifted high. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Pardon me, I can't. I remember this line from Star Wars, the first uh, viewing. That, well, that was episode four, wasn't it? Oh, I remember when we went to see that, we were in uh, Houston, Texas, and said, episode four, I think, I think we missed something. I think, I think we, we need to get caught up. But the first one I ever saw that they ever put out was episode four. They're running Empire Strikes Back this coming week. So if you, if you want to go see that, it's back in theaters. You'll have to observe social distancing. But I remember when uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and the great Darth Vader were doing their battle to the death. Obi-Wan told Darth Vader, he said, if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can imagine. It wasn't Jesus' ability to turn water into wine or to heal the sick that made him powerful. It was that he died. He died. Now in all of this, we see fighting and battles, war and struggling. But as I said, what seems to make it even worse is that there is one side saying, here are our fellow family members, and we're going to join up with some of our greatest enemies so that we can harm them and destroy them. Uh, any kind of story like that has no good ending. Battle, war. Now, on the other side, and I will say this because there is a great deal more about the history of the church, there have been times when we have taken up arms one of some of the most famous Christians in Christian history are the Knights Templar, the Crusaders, people who picked up the sword and opposed the world, completely misinterpreting the teachings of Scripture. When Jesus tells us to go take a city, he doesn't mean to hurt it or harm it or to spill blood. He means to go share the cross and share about Christ. Now, here Isaiah is going to go to King Ahaz and he's going to say, God wants to help you. You know what Isaiah brings with him when he comes in Ahaz's presence? A blank check. He says, I got a blank check here. We're going to see it here in just a minute. God says, fill in any amount you want. He's already signed it. Not completely blank. Just the amount is blank. He's written it to the kingdom of Judah. Isaiah said, I brought you a check. God has said, ask for anything. He says, God says, God wants you to put him to the test. Try and prove him. Your uh, enemies surrounding you. Your family is surrounding you. And they were filled with fear. And Isaiah said, God says, ask him for something. Now, I'm not one of those people who believe that anybody, anywhere at any time, can ask God for anything. And if they just firmly, faithfully believe it, God is obligated to answer their prayer. I believe God can say no to anything he wants to. 
I believe he can say yes to anything he wants to. And I think sometimes God comes to us, or he might come to you. He has come to individuals like this, and he says, I remember a time in the New Testament when Jesus there was speaking to his disciples. He says, you know, up to this point, you never have asked me for anything, which is astounding. Now, some of them had asked, said on his left hand and on his right. He says, Jesus said, ask me for something. Just ask me. In verse 2, it says, Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. What makes it uh, harder to interpret sometimes, they use these code names and these symbolical names. Ephraim is Israel. Ephraim was the name of one of Joseph's sons. And so often when they referring to Israel, they call him Ephraim. To meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped a verse. So the hearts of Ahaz and the people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. The Lord said to Isaiah, Go out you and your son, Shear Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct or the upper pool on the road of the, of the launder's uh, field and say to him, Be careful. Keep calm and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. Because of the fierce angle of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tabal king over it. They already had a successor. They already knew who they were going to put on the throne of Judah. That's how confident they were, and that's how sure they were. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now this is a point. Our, our, our lesson talks about the promises of God. Now I've made this point before in, in other Old Testament studies. But do, do never imagine that prophecy in the Old Testament is mystical future gazing. It's not like tarot cards or reading the stars or palm reading. It's not what the Bible calls in the Old Testament divination. To divine things means to look at signs like the stars or the bumps on your head. Bugs Bunny says, I can read the bumps on your head. The guy says, I don't have any bumps on my head. Bugs pulls out a big wooden mallet and goes bing, 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 like that. And this guy's got bumps all over his head then. And he begins to run his fingers over those bumps then. The lines in your palm, the leaves in the bottom of your teacup after you finish drinking your tea, the chicken bones as they lie upon the ground after you've cast them. No. Prophets were not mystical crystal ball gazers. <laughs> They're just really someone that God literally came to and God told them what he was going to do. He said, now go tell the king what I'm going to do. The only reason Isaiah knew what was going to happen in the future is not because he figured it out. The prophets always say, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. He didn't say, I had some pizza last night and I had some gas and this is, this is what came on me. I was, I was in a funk and all of a sudden it all just surrendered. No, he says, let me tell you what, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. And so King Ahaz said, you mean to tell me that you figured some things out, Isaiah? No, I ain't what I said at all. You mean that you've got to take on where the army should be posted and what tactics or strategies? Which he said, no, I'm going to tell you. I'm here to tell you what God told me that he's going to do. And that's what prophecy is because prophecy is a promise of God. This is what I, I, I have to be careful. I, I'm still not too careful. I'll be talking to people. I talk with people all over the country every day of the week. And they say, are you from Alabama? And I always say, yeah, yeah, I am. I hope it's not that obvious, but I guess it probably is. So where, are you associated with Marshall? They know I'm from Alabama. A lot of times, though, they'll offend me. They'll say, 
Are you in Mississippi? I, I, no, I'm not in Mississippi. I am not in Mississippi. I'm in Alabama. The Stennis Space Center people are associated with the center in, in Mississippi. So, I, I try to use, uh, this is what I'm about to do, but that's, that's still very southern. I've avoided saying, I'm fixing to do this to your computer. I'm fixing to do this. And they say, well, that's why I call you, so you fix something. You, what, are you fixing it? I, I said, no, I'm fixing to turn it off. But I try to say about to. But about to, I intend to, or in a moment, I will proceed to. I, I guess that those are different. But it, about to and fixing to, there's not much difference in them. Isaiah comes to the king and he says, I'm here to tell you what God's fixing to do. It's nothing mystical. It's nothing magical or miraculous. Now listen, it's very important to understand this about God. When we talk about looking in the future and seeing something, that is not why God knows what comes next. Let me tell you what, if I had the gift of the ability, if I had like the gift of prophecy, you see, I could look and I could tell you something's going to happen tomorrow. Right now, I'd have to tell you in my life that I've got more secrets in my life than I like to have. I, I've got all kinds of things that people have looked right at me and said, now don't tell anybody this. <laughs> i got things that I know that Danny and Liz don't know this morning. I, I know stuff y'all don't know. There's stuff I found out last night that y'all don't even know. I hate having secrets, and so does Avery. Avery oh. probably doesn't have any secrets. She is an open book. So if you put, if you'll waterboard Avery just a little bit, it don't waterboard. does it not? No. You won't have to twist her arm. All you got to do is involve her in a conversation, and you'll know all. Bread and butter. <laughs> just get some bread and some bread butter, and, butter. <laughs> and she will tell you what she wants to know. So y'all, y'all will all just have to wonder about what I'm talking about until you find out. Or figure it out. You see, if I knew what was going to happen tomorrow, and then it happened. But you see, there was a point at which I didn't know that. And I had to, I, woo, and I looked and said, oh, look, there's something I didn't know. And now I know it, but I've looked into the future. You cannot, you must not have a vision or an understanding of God where God is learning things or he's seeing things that he never saw before or that he's figuring stuff out that he previously had not figured out. You cannot have a God who's going to say, ooh, look at that, about tomorrow or the next day. Because God knows everything. He knows everything, and he always has. God is not figuring things out. God is not looking into the future and saying, oh, I didn't know that. Now I do. God is never growing in his understanding. He is never growing in the amount of things that he knows. He doesn't know things now that he didn't know yesterday. And so you can't have a theology of God looking into the future to see what's going to happen. That's not why the reason God knows what's going to happen tomorrow is because he's fixing to do something. He knows what he is going to do, and he always does it. God never does anything different than what he was going to do. All right, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. Now, the way we say this in the vernacular, God says, you know, all these people, all these threats are surrounding they're going to take. It's just not going to happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remelah's son. And what he's saying is, he says, this is who their leader is. This is who, this is what their great city is. But he says, I'm giving you an opportunity for God to be your leader. This is their leader. If you let me be your leader, you see, that makes things different. If you do 
not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. He says the key is you and me. If you're committed to me, if you're dedicated to me, then you have what I have. He says they have, uh, Israel has made an allegiance with Syria. I'm sending Isaiah here to meet you on the side road to say, let's make a deal. Let's you and I be together. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths of the highest heights. He said, just, just ask God for a miracle. Ask God for a miracle, a sign, a wonder. Ask God. And Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. There's a lot of our own human piety and our own superfluous pride that would say something like that. Oh, I don't, I'm not going to test the Lord. You see, it's not a test if the Lord says, ask me for this. If you ask him for that, you're not testing him or tempting him. He wants you to ask. If you read in 1 John chapter 5, John there gives the New Testament understanding about prayer. And it seems ridiculous in a way, but it's really this. John, in 1 John chapter 5, he says, if you'll ask God for what he wants you to have, he'll give it to you. And I said, well, duh. You mean if I ask God for what God wants to give me, he'll give it to me? What he's also saying is that if you ask God for what he doesn't want you to have, as we would say in Alabama, you ain't going to get it. The key to asking God for anything is that we must always ask him for what he wants us to have. You see, the, the notion has to start with God. I did this once in a sermon. I, I, I wrapped up a lot of different things in uh, Christmas paper. One of them I wrapped up, and I'm not very good at wrapping even normal, but I wrapped up, I wrapped up a football and I pulled it out of a box. It, and I didn't have it in a box. I just wrapped up a football. And I said, what is that? Then I had a hockey stick. And I had, uh, had things that there was just no question. About. I had a baseball bat. And they were all wrapped up. You, you, just, you could just, and I say, okay, now here are some Christmas presents. And if you can guess what they are, I'll let you have them. One of them was a tennis racket. I had wrapped it up. You know, obviously it was a tennis or a badminton racket. That's the key to prayer. God says, I've got something I want to give you. All I want you to do is ask for it. If we just go around with a shopping list, I remember every year, Mom and Dad would say, what do you want for Christmas? And we'd get that... Sears and Roebuck toy book out. Well, we marked about 50 things in there we wanted. He says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. He said, All right, here it is then. Here it is. Is it enough to try the patience of humans? He said, what he's saying is, Do you think, what do you think about getting on other people's nerves? What he's saying is, what do you think would happen if you ever got on God's nerves? He said, you're getting on God's last nub right now. Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. That's probably where we're going to conclude today. He said, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And we'll call him Emmanuel. Now, Matthew in his gospel quotes Isaiah 7, 14, and he says, this is just like what happened in Jesus' life. Now here, he talks about a virgin. The Hebrew word means young woman. And here, Matthew said, I'm going to pick this verse, and this verse sounds just exactly, God is going to give you a sign. He wanted to give, <coughs> pardon me, he wanted to give Ahaz a sign. Simon wouldn't take it. Ahaz wouldn't accept a sign. Matthew said, God has given you a sign, a virgin shall conceive. Now the word that Matthew used in the word, uh, to describe Mary as a virgin is the word parthenos. Now here this word can, let me tell you, when, they, when you talk about a young woman in ancient times, you were also talk, almost always talking about a virgin. Unless you'd been violently violated in some way. <coughs> Pardon me. 
Here in this passage, he's talking about, here's the time frame. You know how long it takes for a woman to conceive and have a child. And then he says, he will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject wrong and choose the right. <coughs> Pardon me. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. And so he's not talking about a specific person. Here, as far as Ahaz is concerned, he's not really even talking about the Messiah or about Jesus. He says, as long as it takes for a little baby to be conceived and be born and for him to grow up where he does these kinds of things and he knows left from right and good right from wrong, he says, by that time, we're talking about 15, 14, 15, 16, 17 years. And he, what, it's just a way of saying, in, a, in about 17 years, these people that you're worrying about, they're going to be laid waste. He says, so you're worrying about these kingdoms. He says, in the time that it takes for a little baby to be born and for him to grow up to be a teenager, he says, this problem is going to be gone. Now, <clears throat> what Ahaz does, though, you see, they were afraid of Assyria. The reason Israel uh, made this pact with Syria because they were afraid of Assyria. So what Jerusalem does and what King Ahaz does is they make a, instead of trusting God, they make a pact with Assyria against Syria and Israel. Terrible, terrible decision. I'm going to be talking with the children during the Lamb Service today about making choices, and about the choices that God lets us make. With all the choices and the liberty and the freedom that God has given me, I, I trust always also that He is leading me and that I'm following Him. Matthew was, of course, saying, remember that passage, and everybody was familiar with this passage, that in Matthew's time, he says, let me tell you a different uh, uh, application to that. He says, God's given you a son, and his name is Emmanuel. He was talking about Jesus. He was taking a seemingly unrelated passage in Isaiah's writings and saying, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he was saying, here's the sign that God has given you. It's just like the same story in the Old Testament. And if you listen to what God's trying to say to you, if you listen to what he wants to offer you, if you'll accept, here's your sign. Here's your sign. And the sign is Jesus. Well, God is always speaking to us and speaking toward us. As we continue to study Isaiah, he's going to have more and more. Uh, anytime God speaks, it's not just a word that is relevant to Isaiah or to Ahaz, the king, but it stands for all time. Develop your theology so that you have an understanding of God, where God's not making up things as they come up. God doesn't operate in chance. God doesn't, it's not at the mercy of happenstance. God is not looking out into the future trying to figure out what to do. God has always known what he's going to do, what he's about to do, what he's fixing to do. The most important thing in the world that you and I could ever do is connect with God. All right? God bless you all. Thank you for coming today. Ooh, that, that leg went to sleep.